questions along the way, uh, especially in connection, please uh, don't hesitate. So first, I would like to thank the organizers. Uh, this is great to be here. I heard about the summer school already when I was a student back in Montreal a long time ago, so now it's a really an honor to be part of it. Um, <clears throat> so as I announced in the abstract, this is going to be a talk about strategic reasoning. And I want to say what I will mean by reasoning here is a pretty standard view, but it's the idea that reasoning is change in view. So for those of you who know about the work of Gilbert Hartman, uh, <coughs> reasoning is about changing your beliefs, changing your intentions, making decisions, maybe changing other attitudes of yours like preferences, but today we'll focus on decision making and change in beliefs. But we'll focus on these two notion of uh, reasoning in a particular context that is in situations where what you will do and the consequence of what you will do depends on what other people, other decision makers like you will do. So we'll do a little bit of game theory. And our running example here will be one important concept in game theory, uh, so the so-called subgame uh, perfect equilibrium uh, and the related idea of backward induction in extensive games. I'm going to use that because that's one of the oldest and most intuitive concepts uh, in game theory, going back at least to, well, it's been for a long time attributed to Zermelo uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, but it might not be the most intuitive concept. Uh, it's been criticized a lot for counterintuitive consequence, for example, in public goods game or in centipede games. Uh, but because it's so influential, that's a benchmark. So if you want to analyze strategic reasoning, your theory should be able to explain the condition under which the, the players will reason their way to the subgame perfect equilibrium concept. And then if you don't like that concept, then you'll be able to explain under which condition it will not follow that uh, concept. So that's going to be our benchmark that will follow us uh, all through the talk. Um, <clears throat> So we'll, after presenting you a little bit of game theory, we'll look at a uh, theory of, well, I wrote knowledge early on, but now it's gone from the slides. So it's going to be beliefs in extensive game. Uh, but really what I want to bring you to is a theory of belief change or belief revision to connect with the previous talk uh, in extensive game. And we're going to use models, dynamic models of uh, belief update and see that what their consequences are uh, in uh, game theory. Okay, so let's start right away with a very simple example. Um, so most of you have either read the novel or uh, seen one version of the movie, uh, Jane Austen, Pride and Prejudice. And uh, you might know that there's a book recently published called uh, Jane Austen, Game Theorist, uh, where <laughs> the author argues that, that she was actually a very fine game theorist avant la lettre. Um, and uh, well, let's look at one episode in the, the book. So we have Darcy who's wondering whether he should propose, that's the P, or not propose to uh, Elizabeth. And that's the two action he's considering. And uh, well, it was a time where uh, men would propose and, and women would uh, accept or decline the offer. So the options that Elizabeth had are or has are either she accepts the offer or she doesn't accept. And that's a description of the situation. So first, Darcy proposed that if or not, and if, if he proposes, then Elizabeth has a choice between accepting or not accepting the offer. But of course, game theory starts when you have preferences, and that's where the action is uh, in this story. So these numbers here are supposed to represent all the players order the specific consequence of their action. So zero is the worst case scenario, one is sort of the middle point, two is the best case scenario. So, for, and the first number in bracket is Darcy's view of, the thi of things, and the second number is Elizabeth's view of things. So, of course, Darcy would like Elizabeth to accept. Right? So for him, the best option is he proposes and she accepts. Right? So that's represented by a two. And the worst case scenario for him if, is if he proposes, but she rejects. Right? He's humi humiliated, so if you remember the novel, uh, Darcy is this extremely uh, wealthy, 
outspoken young man that has a lot of, uh, a lot of people would like to marry. So being rejected by Elizabeth would be very bad for him and, 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 and very humiliating. So for him, that's the worst case scenario. Uh, <clears throat> A better option, slightly better for him, is just status quo, not proposing, but of course that's not being the best option that if he proposes and she accepts. And in this game, the, 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 the drama of the story is that uh, Elizabeth has the reverse preference. She really doesn't like Darcy. So for her, if, she, if he proposes and she accepts, so they're getting married, that's the worst. That's the worst case scenario. Uh, and she dislikes him so much that actually Humiliating him is the best option for him, right? Okay, so for her. So for her, the best is he proposes and she says no, right? So that, that's the best option. And just like Darcy, at least she agrees on the, the, the status quo. That's the middle side option. So as a game theorist, how you would go out and solve this game? Well, you would start by the end and think what would Elizabeth do if she's proposed, right? If she's to move. Okay, so you look at here and you look at what would she do? Well, for her, the choice is simple, right? She's got to choose between accepting and getting a worst case scenario or rejecting and getting a best case scenario. So if she's proposed, she would go down, right? She would re reject the offer. Now, the classical story in game theory says Darcy can anticipate that. So he realizes that if he proposes, this is, straight, this is going straight down and he's getting his worst option. But if, she do if he doesn't propose, then he's getting his second best. So realizing that for him, you will think, well, I will not propose. So the classical solution of this game, the sub-game perfect equilibrium, is that Darcy does not propose, but if he were to propose, Elizabeth would reject. Okay, so that's the sub-game perfect equilibrium. And the procedure I've used to compute that is called backward induction. So we start by the end and we move towards the leaves of the tree. Let's look at a slightly more complicated example. Uh, it's just an abstract game. There's not such a nice story behind. Um, it's from a recent paper by Andres Pereira. So here, Anne moves first. She, she can choose between A and B. And then if she chooses A, her and Bob play a simultaneous game. So they choose simultaneously. Anne between C and D, Bob between E, F, and G. And the results of their Action is one of the cells in uh, this, mat this matrix. So, well again, how do we solve this game? Well, we start by the end and we look at what would happen if they were to play the simultaneous game. Well, some of you might already realize that um, G is a bad option for Bob, right? Why is that? Because whatever Han does in the simultaneous game, so whether she plays C's or D, <coughs> G gives zero to Bob and if he plays anything else, he gets either a one or a two, which is bad. Okay, so everyone sees that, right? Good. So that's very bad for Bob. So we would assume he will not, he will not play that if he's to play in the, uh, in the simultaneous game. But then Anne can realize that, right? If she's to play in the simultaneous game. But then if G is out, her choice between, is between C and D, but that's between getting a two for sure by playing C or one for sure by playing D. So for her, if G is out, then she should play or she would play C if she's rational. We'll come back to this later. And then you can see how this is going, right? Uh, and Bob can realize that Anne can think about that, right? <clears throat> so Bob uh, will see that for him, the choice is just between E and getting a two because Anne will play C or F getting a one, Anne will play C, right? So he will play, choose E, and Anne realizing that, finally, her choice is between entering the simultaneous game and getting C, E, so a two for sure, or opting out at the beginning and getting a three for sure, so she would opt out at the beginning. Okay. So again, this is just a slightly more complex version. It involves a little bit more steps, but it's essentially the same process. We start by the end of the game and we move backwards, and what we computed is the sub-game perfect equilibrium. Okay. So... <clears throat> This is just game theory 101. You open a textbook in game theory. Uh, this is what you find. And this provides us with a good model, or you might think a good model, of what I'll call strategic interaction. Right? How people in situations of interaction will 
act, so it's a good representation of their actions, maybe powers, what they can achieve, what they cannot achieve. But it's not a, a model of strategic reasoning. Right? So for one thing, at least in the story I've told you, in these trees, there is no representation of uncertainty or what the player believes about one another. In the story I've told you, I've talked about beliefs uh, and, and what Anne thought about Bob, but this is not in the model yet, right? So this is not there. So some of you might know a little bit of game theory and you might think, wait, wait a second, uh, we do a lot of game theory with so-called imperfect information when the player do not know where they are uh, in the game. <clears throat> For example, if you play card with me, I have my cards, you cannot see them, you don't know exactly where you are because you don't know exactly what my cards are. Right? So that's a game of imperfect information. Um, but that's so-called endogenous uncertainty. That's uncertainty that's built in the structure of the game. But if you want to think about strategic reasoning, what's important is strategic uncertainty. Uncertainty about what the other players will do. And even if, and that if endogenous uncertainty is completely resolved, there might still be tons of strategic uncertainty. Think about, you play chess with your friend, she just made her opening, there is no endogenous uncertainty. Everyone knows what just happened, right? It's very easy to follow, there's just one piece. But there's loads of strategic uncertainty because you have to think about what she will do next and how she will react to your move, right? And that's that kind of uncertainty that's important to understand strategic reasoning. So <clears throat> even though game theory, traditional game theory, as a as model of uncertainty, this is not the kind of uncertainty, uncertainty we're interested in to um, represent strategic reasoning. Now, I should say what I've talked about was solution concepts, so subgame perfect equilibrium in this case. Um, and you might think, well, isn't it that a, a model of strategic reasoning? Well, no, it's just a model of the behavioral consequences, maybe of strategic reasoning, right? Maybe that's a result of the decision that the player would make if they reason strategically in this game. But a solution concept in itself, for example, the subgame perfect equilibrium that I presented you, is just a list of action that the players would take. So it's just about the consequence in terms of action, what I call here the behavioral consequences, of what the player would do. Maybe that's a good theory of that, but that's not a theory of strategic reasoning. So even though game theory provides us with a good starting point, a good model of strategic interaction, this is not a, yet a theory of strategic reasoning. We need more to talk about that. And the main thing we will work on uh, for the next couple of minutes is a model of strategic uncertainty. How do we model the player's belief or expectations about what the others will do? Because arguably, this is what you want to know or this is what you make up your mind about. You want to make up your mind about when you decide what to do. If you decide, you, if you play chess, you're considering making a move. What you're thinking about is, how is the other oppo your opponent going to react to that, right? What is the other person going to do? Good. So the main work is going to be done in modeling strategic uncertainty, but I want to say a few more things about the other component that we will use here, but that's one which I will keep mostly fixed for um, this, at least until the very end of the tutorial. That is the choice rule. So if we want to talk about strategic reasoning, we have to talk about what rules the player will use to make a decision on the basis of what they believe is likely to happen and the sort of outcome they prefer. Right? Uh, and here I will follow this, the, the literature on, on epistemic or belief-based analysis of games. Um, and I'll use the sort of main decision theoretic standards uh, which a lot of people think is a maximization of expected utility. Um, but in fact, here I will use a much simpler uh, version than that. Uh, dominance reasoning, which uh, does not require car, uh, interval scale utility, so we don't have to worry about the numbers very much, just the order of preferences, nor graded belief, so I, we can bracket all the consideration about your degree of beliefs, whether they should be representable probabilistically, and so on. We'll just worry about allowed belief, whether you consider something possible or not, essentially in the same way that Malte was presenting it in, in the model earlier. So we'll say that uh, a strategy is strictly dominated 
if there's another strategy available for you such that in all the situations that you believe to be possible, the first one make you strictly worse off than the second. Okay? Now, if you've, again, seen a little bit of game theory before, this is just a standard notion of strict dominance, except I relativize it to what the player believes to be possible. So in standard game theory, you just look at all the possible combination of action for the other players, and you say it's strictly dominated if it's... Um, <coughs> If in all these situations, the first, there's something that gives you a strictly better uh, payoff. Here, I'm restricting possibly on uh, what the player believes. The player might think that there are things that are unlikely to happen and, and just rule them out. Uh, so we want to make room for that. But that's going to be the choice rule I'm going to use uh, basically uh, until the end. But then again, so as a philosopher, I'm taking a, a, a most mostly a normative point of view on that. Uh, of course, from a descriptive point of view, uh, you might think this is not how people decide, and I, I, I think uh, I fully agree with that. Uh, but from a normative point of view, there's still a debate to be made whether this is a good um, rule for decision-making uh, under uncertainty. Um, <clears throat> and there's still a lot of people who think that it is, right? Uh, so I'm reflecting the literature here uh, in uh, taking it as the normative standard for decision making under uncertainty. But now let's look at strategic uncertainty. So first of all, I want to make you realize that um, <clears throat> just assuming that the players are rational is not enough to give us the sub-game perfect equilibrium solution of a game. Okay? Why is that? Well, look at what Darcy should do or would do if he's rational. He should choose between, uh, he's choosing between proposing and not proposing, but of course what's rational for him to do depends on what he believes Elizabeth will do. Okay? So if he believes that Elizabeth will do, will, ac will accept his offer, and for those who've seen the movie, he actually makes a proposal, uh, then maybe that's the rational thing to do because he thinks this is what he's going to get his best uh, best of scenario, right? So the best scenario for him. But if he believes Elizabeth will reject his offer, then he should not propose, right? Because then he will get his second best as opposed to his uh, best option, uh, his worst uh, option, okay? So rationality alone is not enough, right? So just saying Darcy is rational is not setting the question whether he will follow the, the sub perfect equilibrium and go out and uh, just not propose. We need more assumption. But there's actually one easy assumption to give us that. So if we assume that Elizabeth is rational, she's choosing between accepting and not accepting. So for her, accepting is strictly dominated by not accepting, right? Because if she's to choose, then she knows Darcy has proposed. So the only thing uh, that she considers possible are this outcome and that outcome. And then, of course, not accepting is strictly better. Right? So that's just one state possible, and that's uh, not accepting. So she's in full control here. So if she's rational, she will play down. And then if Darcy believes that she's rational, then he believes that this is out as an option, and then the choice ball down between what we had earlier, not proposing or proposing and getting rejected. Okay? So here, we just needed one layer of, of belief in rationality, right? So we had rationality for, Anne, for Elizabeth, and then if, Bob, if Darcy is rational and, <laughs> yes, uh, you get conditioned with these names. Uh, if Darcy is rational and believes that Anne is rational, then he will play down. And this leads to the uh, sub-game perfect equilibrium outcome. Good. Now, but in some games, things are more complicated. And you guess this is exactly what's happening in this uh, normal, uh, normal form game or simultaneous move games. So sometimes, first order belief in rationality, that is just believing that the other is rational, is not enough to lead us to the conclusion we want. Uh, so in this game, if Bob is rational, you can check it, right? He will never play G. There's no belief such that playing G is, ra is rational uh, for him. If Anne believes that Bob is rational, that's one layer, she will not play D, essentially the same reasoning as we had before. But then to <clears throat> conclude that Bob will not play F, we have to assume that he believes, that Anne believes that he's rational. 
Okay, so that's a second order, right? And if he's rational and has that belief, then Bob will play E, and if Anne is rational and believes that Bob is rational, she'll play C, and that's the solution we had for at least this part of the game. Okay? So first order beliefs in rationality, even that is not enough. We need to go sometimes I order. So belief, Anne believes that Bob believes that Anne believes, and maybe high. Okay? Well, how are we going to represent that? We're going to use a standard um, modal logic uh, for belief, uh, representing that, uh, so it's going to be a propositional language, uh, and here we're making things very simple for us. Instead of working with arbitrary propositional letter, we're using a bunch of primitive. We have primitive for strategies, which says agent I plays strategy S. We'll see example of that later on. And we have a primitive, that might be a lot bigger assumption, but that's just because I don't want to bother you with this very long definition of a language, which too many operators to read from. So this is the RI is a primitive for agent I is rational. Okay? Uh, of course, you could analyze it using uh, a combination of action, preferences, and belief, but you, ha you would have to add these modalities, and that's not the focus here. So we'll keep these as uh, primitive. So we have two types of, of basic atomic proposition. Agent I plays a strategy S. Agent I is rational. And we can form more complex sentences by using your favorite Boolean connectives. And then we have our belief modality, one for each agent I. So BI phi means agent I believes phi. Now, I'm going to assume here that this belief operator is a so-called KD45 operator, right? And that's uh, the axioms and rules that are here. So K means, I assume that the belief is a so-called normal modality, like we had earlier. The epistemic modality was a normal modality. Uh, so <coughs> beliefs are closed under belief consequence. That's K, right? In particular, the players are logically omniscient. They believe all logical tautology and all everything that follows logically from their belief. So it's a combination of K and necessitation, right? D says that the beliefs are consistent. So if I believe phi, then it's not true that I believe not phi. Okay? So I never believe phi and not phi at the same time. And then 4 and 5 are introspection axiom. If I believe phi, then I believe that I believe phi. If I dis if if I do not believe phi, then I believe that I do not believe phi. Okay. Now, I'm sure everyone seeing these axioms in less than three minutes can think about one counterexample for each of them, right? I'm, I'm sure, right? So finding counterexample to that is, is a very easy task, okay? Um, I'm using this for the simple reason that it makes, it allows me to draw aesthetically pleasing, aesthetically pleasing models, that is, we can interpret this belief using a possible word model like we had earlier, a partial pre-order on this model, which says which word you consider more plausible than others, and you would define beliefs as you believe something if it's true in all the world you consider most plausible. Okay? So if you do that, then you will validate all these axioms, but also if you validate these axioms, you allow to do that. Okay? So, that's the reason I'm doing this and allow me to draw nice pictures uh, later on. But as you will see in this little toy game theoretic reasoning that we uh, <coughs> will do in a minute, I'm using a small, small, small fraction of that. Right? Okay, so there's actually very little. And you could weaken the logic uh, <coughs> to drop basically a lot of these assumptions. I'm only using one particular assumption, you will see. Uh, but then the model just becomes much more complex and much less easier to draw, uh, which <coughs> for, for an uh, entry point into that kind of logic uh, is not so good. All right, so that's going to be our logic of belief. Two things I want to uh, mention. First of all, so I presented you with the logic of higher order belief, right? So students or everyone who has not seen that kind of thing before, why am I saying that I can represent beliefs about beliefs in this? Everyone seeing that? Don't be shy. <laughs> okay, Malta, if you were a student, what would you say? <laughs> I'm shy. Oh, you're shy. <laughs> All right, okay. 
then let, let's say, if I was a student, what would I say? Well, I would raise my hand and say, well, look, the definition of the language allows for an arbitrary formula. That's, of course, what I would say in, uh, in the scope of the belief operator, right? So in particular, this phi can itself be a belief formula, okay? So I can write down formulas like Anne believes that Bob believes that Anne is playing strategy I. Okay, so that's, a, but that's one kind of formula. So this belief also encodes uh, all the I order. So this language allows me to write all the I order beliefs that I want. But one thing that you might notice, there's absolutely no axiom regimenting the interaction between the people's belief, right? So there's nothing like if Anne believes P, then Bob must believe P as well, right? This is all about single person, right? Okay, good. The other thing I want to mention is that there's a natural way to generalize that to conditional belief. And if you do that, you get a system which is non-monotonic exactly in the same way as Malta uh, was talking about earlier. Okay? So the classical consequence relation here, this turnstile, is completely classical. It's monotonic. Right? Okay? But this is just a different way to approach things. Instead of changing the classical consequence, we change the belief operator. Right? So we put the change in the modality as opposed to put it uh, in the consequence relation. But I think it's just we're just cousin, right? So that's cousin-like uh, type of story. Okay, so let's put this thing into to work. So let's go back to our uh, little Darcy and Elizabeth example. So one particular model we can use to represent that will be a set of possible worlds like we have uh, on top. Uh, and we'll take here, just to make things simple, only four possible worlds representing the possible strategic combination of strategies for each player, right? So the top uh, left corner is one where Darcy proposed and Elizabeth accept. Top right proposed and Elizabeth doesn't accept. Down, he doesn't propose, and if he would propose, Elizabeth would accept. Down right, uh, he doesn't propose, but if he would, Elizabeth would not accept, okay? Good. Now I want to explore with you the consequences of assuming that the players are rational and they believe that each other are rational and all this would look like in a model like this. Okay? Good. Well, one thing we know from uh, the story I told you before is that if Elizabeth is rational, right? she will not play A, right? Okay, she will not accept, right? Because as we said earlier, if she's to play, there's only these two things possible and um, <laughs> then accepting becomes strictly dominated for her. Now, we can represent that in our model. We'll assume true value of the atomic proposition, Elizabeth is rational to all the states where she doesn't play A, and uh, we'll say she's not rational in all the states where she's not playing A. Where she is playing A, where she is accepting the offer. Okay. Good. All right. Uh, now let's reason a little bit about what, what would happen if Bob, I'll say it again, if Darcy believes that Elizabeth uh, is rational. Well, this you might observe is true everywhere in the model, right? So that every state. This implication, this good old material conditional, if Elizabeth is rational, then she doesn't play A, is true, right? Okay. Um, so, since this is true everywhere in the model, we'll use a little bit of necessitation and K and conclude that if Bob believes, if, yeah, I say it again, if Darcy believes that Elizabeth is rational, then he must believe that she's not playing A. Okay, good, right? I'm using K in necessitation here, sort of, um, to conclude that. That's good. Uh, now, suppose we want to draw it in the model. What does it look like when, uh, Elizabeth, when Bob believes that Elizabeth is rational? As I say, we interpret that using a plausibility ordering, which says which states are more plausible than other. If Darcy believes that Elizabeth is rational, then all the states where she's rational are more plausible than the states where she's not rational. And I'll represent that with an arrow, okay? So, it's good, right? That's good. 
But now we know something more, right? On top of this, uh, we also know that if Darcy is rational and he believes that Elizabeth is not playing A, essentially what we said earlier, right? Then he will play, he will not propose. Okay? Good? <coughs> now we can put all this together, right? Just play with your classical consequential relation and reach the conclusion that if Elizabeth is rational, Darcy is rational, and Darcy believes that Elizabeth is rational, then they, Elizabeth will not play A, and Darcy will not propose. So how do we represent this reasoning in our little model? Well, now we've, we know uh, where, at which point Elizabeth is rational, and at which point um, what Darcy believes. So we can conclude that in all the states where, well, let's, let's look at them uh, one by one. So if you look up, right, in all the up states, Darcy believes that Elizabeth is rational, so she's not accepting his offer. But nonetheless, he proposes, right? So in none of these states, he's rational because he's choosing an action which leads him to a strictly worse payoff as far as, he's, as what he's believed is concerned, okay? So in none of the state above, he's rational. In the states below, he is actually uh, rational because he believes that Elizabeth will reject his offer. Now in the left, down left state, his belief is just wrong, okay? Too bad for him, right? Elizabeth would accept, right? Uh, but as far as what he believes, she would reject, and he does the right thing. He does not propose, so he's rational there. Now you can see in this model, there's just one point in which both players are rational, and then we encode in the notion that, that Bob believes, that Darcy believes that Elizabeth is rational, and that's the bottom right corner, and that's the point where they play the subgame perfect equilibrium. That is, Darcy does not propose, and Elizabeth, if she were to uh, be proposed, would reject the offer. Okay? Now I want to go back quickly on this little piece of reasoning here. You see, the only thing I've used here is, I said K and necessitation, actually you don't even need that. All you need is a form of regularity, right? So if phi implies psi, then if you believe phi, you believe psi. Okay? That's the only thing you need. I haven't used a single bit of introspection uh, or uh, any of the stronger, it's, the beliefs don't have to be closed under conjunction and so on, and this reasoning goes through, all right? So as I said, we have nice pictures, but if you do want to make it more realistic and drop some of these assumptions, you can and the reasoning will still go through. All right. Now, in the model that I gave you, there was one, so in this little example, there was one step uh, of belief about rationality which was enough to give us a subgame perfect equilibrium. In the matrix, we needed actually two. And in general, we'll need a lot of them, right? And that's where the notion of common belief comes in, right? So here, I'll us usually define it. So we're going to say that uh, everyone believes phi is just defined as everyone believes phi, right? So everyone believes phi, E phi is defined as for each player in the game, that player believes phi, okay? Now, we'll say that everyone believes phi up to level n plus 1 if every, everyone believes that everyone believes phi up to level n, and zero is the one up there, okay? So it's a higher order notion, right? So if everyone believes that everyone, up to level two, that everyone's rational, that everyone believes that everyone's rational, and everyone believes that everyone believes that everyone's rational. Okay. Now, common belief is defined as the limit of that process, right? So it's defined as everyone believes phi for all, up to level n for all n. Okay, so that's, that's an infinitary notion, but it's not definable in the language that I gave you before because it requires an infinite conjunction. Uh, so we have to take it as a primitive operator, but nonetheless, it's an operator which is axiomatizable, so if you're interested, it's a normal modality, so it satisfies K and necessitation, and you can axiomatize it using what's so-called a fixed point axiom, uh, saying if something is common belief, that it's, everybody believes that it's common belief, 
And maybe the more interesting one, the induction axioms, which says, if it's common belief, that is, if phi is true, everyone believes phi, then if everyone believes phi, phi is common belief. Okay? Now, you might see, but why is it called the induction axiom, right? It says, if everywhere, if you have phi, you can make one more step, right? So that has more the induction flavor. Then, if you can make step one, you can make all the steps. Okay, so if you've done an argument by induction, this is essentially what it does. Okay, so that's the induction axiom. Now, I won't say anything more about the uh, logic of common beliefs, but that's the way it's defined, and that's the way it's axiomatized. Good. Now we can put things together. So I presented you one little example, waved my hand at the second one, but there's a number of results that put things together for arbitrary uh, extensive game. Uh, the canonical one uses a stronger notion. So that's from uh, Robert Ahman. Common knowledge of rationality implies the backward induction solution in extensive game with perfect information. So he uses the notion of knowledge here as opposed to belief. Uh, but it's been weakened. In a fully probabilistic setting, uh, we can say, under some assumption, that rationality and common belief in rationality implies the backward induction solution. But there's, so if you're doing this, so the Brandenburger paper, if you look at this, uh, you'll see this is done in a full graded beliefs model where you have not only beliefs about the graded beliefs, uh, well, not, graded, not only graded beliefs about what the other will do, but also graded beliefs about the graded beliefs of others. Things get pretty complicated very quickly. Um, and there you need some slight, you need a couple of additional assumptions, which we can discuss in the question period if you want to get backward induction, but you can get it. So this is closer to the story I've been told. But the story complexifies and gets more fun. So there's a theorem by Stanlacher that says common knowledge of rationality does not imply backward induction. So if you follow, that's the exact negation of, of Amund's theorem, right? And both are correct, and I'm not a paraconsistent logician. Um, so what's going on here is that, um, and this will come back, this is an important result from uh, Stalnacker, and there's an excellent survey paper by Joe Alpern, uh, which you will meet next week, I think, um, that explains the situation, is that Amund and uh, Stalnaker used different notion of belief revision, and that's what drives the difference in results. Stalnaker used a, bit more, a, more, a much more uh, permissive notion of belief revision, uh, which is not enough to give you backward induction, while Amund's is very, very extremely rigid. Now, maybe the one weak, nice form of way to explain what uh, guarantee backward induction is more recent results, which says if you want to get backward induction, you need all players to be rational. And at each node in the tree, you need them to believe that from now on, everyone else is going to be rational. Okay? So this is what says belief in future rationality. So you don't have to make hypotheses about what you just saw, but if you believe that from now on, everyone is going to be rational, and this is common belief, then you get uh, the backward induction solution on the subgame perfect equilibrium. So that's, based, that's a relatively weak, at least compared to common knowledge, that's a rather, relatively weak assumption. Uh, but we'll see it coming back. It highlights maybe our implausible, at least from a normative point of view, the sort of belief revision uh, policy that, that um, gives you back one induction is. But I'll come back to this uh, towards the end. How am I doing time-wise? I have four more minutes. Oh, my God. That's, that's the answer I did not want to hear. Okay. <laughs> Right, well, let me just go quickly. That's, well, okay, let me go quickly. So, this is a good model of strategic uncertainty, but that's not yet a model of strategic reasoning because we don't have a story about how the people arrived at conditions like common belief and rationality, or how on earth could Bob conclude that Anne is rational in the second game, or that Darcy uh, conclude that uh, Elizabeth is rational in the first game. So we need a dynamic model, and this is where I'm afraid I'll have to run through, but so what I'm, what I'm going to be using here uh, is a model of belief change, which there's many of them on the market. This one is called radical upgrade. So what you do, you change your belief in a way which is public, that's very important. Not necessarily truthful, I can learn false information, but more importantly, defeasible, right? So I can learn things and unlearn them later on, so my inferences can be defeated. Okay, so that's also an unmonophonic system. Um, 
And what it does in the picture is that it puts all the states that are where phi is true, if you radical upgrade by phi above, or you make them strictly more plausible than are the non-phi state, and you keep the rest unchanged. All right, so instead, instead of deleting, like we had in update semantics, right, now we just reorder things, right? We shuffle things around, okay? Um, and this logic has nice axiomatization. I won't say anything about that except flashing this, this dread, very scary looking formula. Um, I just want to say something about uh, belief revision that we said earlier. If we, we saw earlier, the success postulate is not valid here, right? And I, that's how it should be, because these language include statements about your own belief, and this allows for formulas which makes themselves false if you learn them, okay? So for example, I get the information that P is true, but that I don't believe it. If I update with that, then after that, I believe P, right? So the formula is actually true, okay? So uh, if you have a rich language like this, this operator satisfies a lot of the, con uh, the condition that Malta presented, but it does not satisfy the success postulate. Okay, so that, and that's very important. All right, so how does it work? Well, that's our little model again. So what we do to represent the reasoning, instead of assuming that Bob believes, or that Darcy believes that Elizabeth is rational, we start by assuming that the player are in the maximal state of uncertainty, right? They consider everything possible and everything equally plausible. Okay, so that's why all these double arrow mean. And what you do is do, you announce repeatedly that the players are rational and you reorder things as you go. So start by announcing, making an upgrade by Elizabeth is rational and uh, Darcy is rational will result in, so you, let's do it again so that you see the change. You put all the non-A state in front of the A state for the reason we've seen earlier. So, the first update puts all the states on the right as more, more plausible than all the states on the left. But it doesn't move anything regarding to Darcy because whether Darcy is rational depends on what he believes about uh, Elizabeth. Right? But once we have that and Darcy believes Elizabeth will not play A, so one more announcement or one more radical upgrade puts all the states where Darcy um, uh, does not propose strictly more plausible in the states where he proposed. <clears throat> and if we keep announcing, we stay at that model. Okay, so any more announcement of rationality, so that's a fixed point, right? So again, in the uh, terminology of the last talk, the players are committed at that point because announcing doesn't change the model at all. And as you see, again, the backward induction solution of the subgame perfect equilibrium is the one which is most plausible, right? And uh, that's the one at that state, it is common belief that all the players are rational. So the general picture of that is that actually we can mimic the emergence of this common belief in rationality by looking at the limit behavior of uh, this radical upgrade. Indeed, so if you do iterated radical upgrade by rationality, you, you always reach a fixed point, which is Depends on your operation, not obvious, but in this case, this is a monotonic operation, so you do reach a fixed point. Um, and at this fixed point, the rational, if the players are rational, then uh, they will play subgame perfect equilibrium. Okay, so common belief can be reached, can be viewed as the end pro, the limit of this reasoning process by which the player says, well, what would happen if the other is rational? But what would happen if they realized that? What would happen if they realized that? And they keep going. And the important thing is that they might need much more than one step in order to reach their conclusion. All right. So let me open up as, as conclusion. I mean, the general picture of reasoning we have is that we start with a particular model of what the players believe. We announce that they're rational. We end up in a new model. We announce that they're rational. We end up in a new model. And we keep going, right? Until, hopefully, things will stop uh, iterating. But we can open that in very different ways. Um, so here I've used, so we can use different belief change or belief revision policy. So if I, here, what I've mentioned very quickly was radical upgrade, where you put all the states where the player is rational strictly above all the, play, the states where the player are not rational. But you might do other operations on the model, right? You might just take the most plausible states where the players are rational and move these on top and leave the rest unchanged. 
Or you might just cut them all and, and delete all the states where the players are uh, not rational. That's another way, right? Uh, and depending on uh, which operation you use, you'll have different consequences on whether you reach a, a fixed point in the first place, right? So public announcement, the one where you delete everything or radical upgrade, what I did, always reaches a fixed point, at least for unconditional belief. But that's not true if you use a weaker notion, right? Sometimes you, can, you get loops. Um, now, you can also change the notion of rationality, right? So all along I've used dominance reasoning, and I said I take it as a consequence, a qualitative consequence of maximization of expected utility. But if you don't like that, you can use a different choice rule, right? And see whether you, you, you also reach a fixed point. And in particular, um, one very plausible, many people think, no alternative to strict dominance is weak dominance, right? So a strategy is weakly dominated if there's another one which is at least as good as the one you're playing now in all possible cases and sometimes it's strictly better. Okay. Well, this for all exists combination of quantifiers makes the uh, weak dominance uh, much more interesting, uh, leads to paradoxes and sometimes uh, uh, leads you not to reaching fixed points. Uh, in, in, this, in that sort of process, right? And that's just one simple tweak, right? So, of course, if you introduce other choice rule like min-max or regret minimization or even some heuristic, your favorite heuristics, things will get much more complicated, okay? But floor is open on that. And finally, I just want to say, but this is much more recent work. Some people have started to look, so now what's red are the three dots at the end, right? Uh, so what, what you might want to look at is different notion of stability, okay? So now I have all, in all the first uh, two groups of results that I mentioned, uh, you look at stability as reaching a fixed point. We reach a model after which nothing changed. But maybe you might think, well, if we oscillate between two or three models in the space, infinite space of all possible models, that's actually not so bad, right? So maybe we should look at maybe oscillation or approaching a particular model and so on. And of course, there you, you move towards dynamic systems. Um, and uh, there's more recent work trying to connect this more qualitative picture that I told you with the more sort of graded uh, transition uh, that you have in uh, dynamic systems. Um, but it's just the beginning. Things people have just started. Good. Oh, yeah. Do we have 30 seconds? 30 seconds. OK. OK. I just want to leave you with a puzzle, right? Suppose you're Bob, you're to play. It means Anne played A, right? What should you think about her? The backward induction algorithm says you should discard this as a mistake and think she will be rational from now on. But this is, this is not the only option, right? You might think, well, if she plays A, she discarded a three for sure for that game. So she must believe that I will play G, because that's the only way that makes this move rationalizable, right? But then if she believes that I'll play G, then she'll play D, right? And then you should play F, okay? So if you interpret Anne's move in a different way, which might be more plausible than just say, ah, she made a mistake, then you get a different solution, right? And that's where all the epistemics and the fun comes in, but we can discuss this uh, in the question period if there is time uh, for that. Thank you.